Okay, this morning we are talking about what has love got, or sorry, what's love got to do with it? And I remember when this song first came out, I was actually quite offended by it. I didn't listen to it for a long time. I'd be driving around in my car um, as a young man uh, in, in the 1980s. And it was a long time before I realized actually a song isn't necessarily about the title. And of course, this, there's, a, there's a much bigger story going on here. You've got someone who's hurt and broken and has been let down. And so they've twisted reality to try and cope with everything they're dealing with. And in a sense, that's what we're, di- we're talking about this morning. We're going to be looking at something that I think we've got disconnected from. It's been mus- misunderstood. And if I do my job right, and um, if we put our faith in the Holy Spirit, hopefully we'll come out with some understanding that won't just be a nice message. My goal is that it's going to actually put a strengthening in into our foundation as Christians to give us more certainty. So with that in mind, let's, let's just pray together right now and come into agreement because we, we, we need the Holy Spirit's help here because I'm taking about eight hours of teaching and I'm going to do it in uh, less than 30 minutes. So <laughs> let, let's see how it goes. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. Oh, our great God, that you're not separated from us because we're not in a building. Um, we're apart in miles, but we're one in spirit. And Lord, you've seen the wrestling that's been going on this week as I've worked on this message. I ask now that you would anoint me to speak words that are spirit, that they are life, and that you would give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us right now. The the word of the Holy Spirit to the churches so that we can go away from this with something solid, something powerful, something real that we didn't arrive with this morning. And the praise, the honor, and all the glory is yours, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good, good, good. So we're talking about, we obviously we're talking about love this morning. And we are talking about where where does it fit in our story? Because we tend to, um, when we use the Bible, um, very often we go to, or I, I can go to, the Old Testament, and I can see that God has got a plan for my life, or I can go to Philippians, and uh, that I, I've got strength in tough times, or I can go to John and see that he loves me, or I can go to the 130s in the Psalms and see how good he is. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but it is very, very incomplete. But I would say that for most Christians, that's their experience of the Bible. And so what I want to do today is to start to see it a little bit differently and to, for us to start to think of a story. Now, on the screen now, you can see some of my story. And if you had sort of or you have any uh, expertise or awareness um, in how people tick, you could probably pull from that. Well, Mark's story, Mark's life is he's got several main components there. And that would probably be my faith, my family, and my friends. And then you've got different things there going back through the years uh, and my little clan there. And of course, you could dig deeper and you could go, you could see themes that run all the way through from when I was small. And you've got your story too. And I know for a lot of you, you were born in other countries. So your story is going to have things in it that mine doesn't. Now, what joins us together, of course, is our values, is that we're we're in Christ. But the more we start to appreciate each other's story, the more we will understand each other. And the reason I'm saying this is because the Bible has a story. And for at least through the Old Testament, that is, in a very real way, that's the story of Israel, because... um, nations have a story this nation has a story and there are idioms and things that you can say that are instantly make you aware of what's going on if you go to someone of my age and just say we'll fight them on the beaches that brings just a whole wealth of understanding with it um you know they think it's all over it is now now some of you might have no idea what i'm talking about Anybody who was born in the 60s and 70s in this country, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
And that's the power of the story. And when we start to understand the story, we start to understand the person and we start to understand what's going on. And Israel's story, at least a part of it, was that God had divorced all the nations of the world. You go to Genesis chapter 10, around there, by the Tower of Babel. And then he turned around and he chose Abraham. And from Abraham, he raised a nation. And they were chosen. They were loved. That they did that God said again and again. They weren't, he didn't choose them because they were they were many. He didn't choose them because they were mighty. He didn't choose them because they were super smart. They were none of those things. He just chose them. And they were the only nation in the whole world to have a covenant with, with Yahweh. Now, Yahweh was connected to other people. The Bible shows that, people like Job, but as a nation. They had this amazing relationship that their king wasn't someone who was claiming to be descended from a deity like Pharaoh or like the Babylonian kings. You know, and that takes us back into Genesis when the sons of God laid with the sons of women. There's a whole story there, which um, perhaps uh, we can share sometime. But no, Israel's king was actually Yahweh himself. And You've got a picture of the tabernacle, tabernacle, the tabernacle there. And that tabernacle looked almost identical, say, to uh, Pharaoh's battle tent or the Babylonian king's battle tent. Why? Because Yahweh was there. He was on the ground with his people. He was leading them. And that's why you have all those Old Testament stories of they would take the Ark of the Covenant and win these massive victories when they were hugely overwhelmed. This was Israel's story. And it, now that we are in Christ, well, it's our story too. And I think for most of us, that's something that we struggle to connect to. It's something that's a bit distant. And my encouragement to you would be in your studies, don't start becoming Jewish because that would be silly, but start to become aware of this amazing heritage because it's what gives the context to where we are now. Now, something that we have to understand about what's going on here with Israel is they have a covenant with God. And God said, I will do all this for you if you will do this. And I know we read the old covenant and it seems really complex and really weird. But actually, once you get your head around it, it's fairly straightforward. It's live a lifestyle whose morality reflects God. So we don't murder and we don't steal other people's family members and uh, we, we, we don't uh, worship anyone other than Yahweh. That's all fairly straightforward. And then all the stuff that we find strange, it was speaking to the people about Yahweh being separate from death. And he was separate from hatred, all the evil that the other gods were all associated with, with all their perversions and their wickedness and their hatefulness. God that had nothing to do with that. And so all of these things were don't do this and only wear that. They're all pointing to Yahweh's otherness, that he's not like the other gods because, well, he's the creator. All these other gods are rebels. They are pretenders. There's either just a human singing to a piece of wood or there is an entity there there's a reality there but it's a created being it's not like Yahweh he is different from everybody else now the problem poor old Israel had was they had sin as well and of course you know the story they rebelled more and more until they got to the point that they were uh, taking their children to Molech and sacrificing their children in the fire and the most horrible and grotesque ways and that was enough for Yahweh he, he just that that's it I am done and you are going into exile now it's really worth noting that when he put them into exile he didn't abandon them and we'll pick that up again in a minute but for them the land that piece of territory that God had carved out for them that was how they connected to God. And at the center of it was the temple and, the, and heaven and earth reconnected at the temple. So that was why you would actually have the glory of God. The manifest glory of God was in the Holy of Holies in the tent of meeting. The manifest glory of God 
was in Solomon's temple. You know, he prayed and fire came from heaven and the cloud of the Shekinah glory floods the place and all the priests are going, and they're all flaking out under the power of God. And so when they went into exile, that was really, really painful. Um, that, that they knew that they were experiencing a separation from God's love. So and this isn't one of those messages where if we were in a building right now, you'd all be standing up waving your hankies at me and going, preach it, brother. This is, this is a teaching, but I hope that as we start to move on, if you can stick with me, you'll go, oh. Um, and then you might want to stand on your chair and wave your hanky, but um, that's up to you. Uh, perhaps shouldn't do it on the, on the front room furniture. Now, in all of this, one thing Israel understood was they understood God's love. And I've just picked on one verse here uh, for the sake of time. And the psalmist says, do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. And that's Psalm 40. And I've put the, I've just highlighted there the word love. And if you could read that in Hebrew, you would see the word Hasid. And one of the other things that we have where we're distant from it is we just read the word love and, you know, I love steak, uh, I love a good movie, I love hiking, and I love my wife. And so love for us, it can have all sorts of meanings. And then you've got the romantic meanings, and then we can even have lust, and we call that love in our mixed up culture. But for the Israelites, when you talked about love, you were talking about affection, but actually what was in their mind, what was in their heart when they were praying this psalm, maybe they were crying out why they were in captivity or they would have prayed this when they were looking for the Messiah to come. Do not withhold your strength, your steadfastness and your love. So it's this whole idea of God, God, and I mean, how strong is God, okay? So Yahweh made his strength available for his people. He was absolutely steadfast. If you read through the prophets, even after he's put Israel into exile, and the temple is destroyed and people have died. And then God goes, oh, Israel. And he still can't let go of them. His faithfulness to them is absolutely off the scale it's something we have to surrender to rather than fully understand God's kindness and God's loyalty is amazing and we when we look at the old testament people tend to go oh angry God oh mean God oh nasty God no 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 you just haven't read it properly yet I want to tell you the grace of God oozes out the pages of the old testament the kindness of God every time you flip the page it's there We've just got to know how to read it. Now, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. That's the Old Testament. And he wants us to know that. So Israel's entire story was based around the unmerited love of God. And that's the key there is it was unmerited. He just chose them. He just said, Abraham, it's you. And Abraham didn't buy a lottery ticket. He didn't do anything particularly well. God liked the fact that he would pass on what he'd learned. But, you know, he wasn't exactly a shining example in some areas. And yet God brought this whole nation into the world through him. And they were God's choice. And they understood that they, it was God's love for them that uh, put them where they were. And they got into trouble when either they forgot they were there by God's love or they try to earn that love. And if you're taking notes, you perhaps want to underline the word earn. They were trying to earn something that is given as a gift. And that's why the Pharisees were so full of stuff when Jesus uh, entered on the scene, because they were trying to ramp the law up to such a level that, that God would go, oh, now I'm happy to return because they had been put into exile, they'd been brought back into it to Israel, 
But I think, what was it, the Syrians first and then Rome invaded. They were not a free people. They weren't seeing the glory of God in the temple. And they were waiting for the kingdom of God to come. They wanted God's rule back in their nation. And they knew that it was their sins that had driven it away. That God was good. God loved them. But because of their sin, they had got themselves to this place of separation. But like I said just now, they were abandoned, but they weren't forgotten. And, you know, we, I can't help it. You know, if that's how God was treating Israel on the old covenant, you know, God never forgot them. He never really, in their mind, they were abandoned because they were in a separate nation. But he still told them to pray. He still told them to call out to him. And he was still making promises right up to the 400 silent years to a nation that he put into exile. Now, let's look at something that's a little bit contentious. Let's have a little bit of fun and see, see if I can get this done on time. The temple is abandoned. It's been destroyed. Israel have been driven out of the country now. Uh, both kingdoms, they're under the heel of their oppressors. And then you get Ezekiel. Interesting book. And there are some amazing statements in there. And one of the things that Israel was mourning was they had lost the glory, the Shekinah. They no longer had the glory of God. And in Ezekiel chapter 43, God makes this promise. The glory of the Lord, this is Israel's vision. This is what he's seeing. The glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple, not just in the Holy of Holies. The glory is now out in the inner court. God is moving in a profound and massive way. And the glory didn't come down from heaven like with um, uh, when Solomon prayed. The glory is coming in from the east. So everything is being touched by the glory of God. And so Israel knew that the glory was going to come back to the temple. And by the time Jesus came, this has reached fever pitch. I mean, there's all sorts of things going on, but it's like, coming back. We've got a building and we've got this. Come on, Yahweh. Come on, Yahweh. Send your glory. And of course he did. But when the glory came, they rejected him. And that's why if you read the book of John, John goes on again and again. Do you remember, for example, when Jesus turned the water into wine? He showed them his glory. Is the glory of God turned up in the person of Jesus? And they missed him. He was rejected. And so sadly, what did they get? Even more judgment. But let's bring some good news into it now, because I do want you to finish uh, today's, today's meeting with a smile. At the same time, Jesus fulfills God's promises to Abraham. What did God say to Abraham? Through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Not just you, Abraham. I'm raising you, Abraham, to raise a nation, Abraham, to raise a man through whom I am going to reach every nation on the planet. And of course, Israel's rejection of Christ turned into the world's salvation. And anyone in Israel who wanted to be saved at that time, they could be too. So God, he hadn't abandoned anyone. He hadn't forgotten. He knew they would sin. He knew they would drop the ball. And he was, he had a plan that was there from before the world was made. And whilst this was going on, some people are starting to go, mm, wait a minute. What the, 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 the. And so you get Nicodemus turn up and he, you know, in John chapter three, and he starts asking questions, you know, Jesus, you couldn't be doing all this unless God was with you. People were doing the math. And of course, Jesus starts to unveil himself and reveal himself to Israel more and more, obviously, in more and more powerful ways. And you know the story. Um, he told them he was God. They didn't like it. So they killed him. But just to prove that he was, he came back on the third day. And of course, now uh, he's our resurrected king and we are in a new covenant. But now we've got another problem. Jesus is risen. He's got his apostles. The word is going out. The churches are growing. 
how do you explain everything I've just tried to explain to you in this tiny amount of time, which is quite awkward for us to get our heads around. How do you explain this with a crucified Messiah to a Jew, let alone to the Gentiles? How do you, how do you tell this story? How do you get this story out into the world? How do I get this story so it actually affects my life? So I'm not just in some dead religion. I'm actually doing something. Something real is happening. Well, if we go to uh, the Gospel of John, we're going to see something of how they did that. And the whole, all the Gospels, all the letters, these are taking the teachings of Jesus and the, the example of Jesus and then unpacking them so we can get our heads around it and we can then live it. How do you explain this? Well, we mentioned Nicodemus just now, and you know John 3, 16, but I'm going to read it because I really like it. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I mean, that's straightforward, isn't it? You know, believe in Jesus, have eternal life. Now, one day we're going to have a really good discussion about what eternal life is um, and what the kingdom of God is, because that's really exciting as well, but we don't have time. The word I've, I've highlighted there, for this is how God loved. And so what the apostles did, including John, I'm not sure that's an accurate likeness we've got there, but anyway, I'm told it's him. J John and Paul and all the other apostles, whether they had they communicated with each other, whether it was just a move of the Holy Spirit, we don't know. But they hijacked a word and they used it to describe God. They, they hijacked this Greek word and they wanted something like the Old Testament word Hasid that would describe his actions, his faithfulness, his nature, how we should act towards others and how we should act towards God himself. And so they got this word and we translate it loved. But in the old, what you would see if you read it in the old language, if you read it in the Greek, and I know a lot of you would know that. And by the way, don't worry, I'm not going to make you go through every single line here. But I would encourage you to get a Vines dictionary or to get the recording of this and just, just spend a little time thinking about this. Because they redefined the word agape. It was already around. It meant love. But they took it and they said, this agape that's God's attitude towards us and it's God's attitude towards his son humanity anyone who believes it's how he wants us to treat each other it's what he wants us to demonstrate to the world he wants agape to be seen in the body of Christ so we could say agape love and I'd encourage you if, if you know get a bible dictionary and you can get them all on your phone now and find out where this word turns up in the New Testament and maybe for a season call it agape and say well why would I do that Mark because it will reprogram your thinking so when you say love you don't think pizza you think covenant <laughs> when you say love you don't think your puppy or your, your your kitten you think the covenant and agape is actually very much the love of family now this was supposed to be a yellow highlight, but it's turned into a horrible green thing. I've put right in the middle there. Love can be known only from the actions it prompts. And that's the big difference we want here. If you watch um, a romantic movie or, you know, a series, a, a love story, or you go back to Romeo and Juliet, whatever it is. Um, actually, they did have some actions in there, but they weren't healthy. Um, very much love is something that I feel and it's really intense and within our culture right now it's what I feel what I feel what I feel what I feel and no 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 covenant love is action how do I how do I know God loves me and you've heard this Jesus how do I know you love me he opened his arms and brought me to himself you know on the cross that demonstrates how much God loves us how much you've got to love someone to get nailed to a cross when you didn't have to and we, we struggle with that because we're always looking for the feelings and that's what gets us in trouble. So God's love is seen, that second paragraph, we'll just touch on that, in the gift of his son. And then I want to pick up the, I've put it, I've just made it in bold there. It was not drawn out by any excellency in its objects. 
God loves you, but he doesn't love you because you're lovely. He loves you because he is lovely. He doesn't love you because you're good. He loves you because you are good. And what we tend to do is say, look, God, look how much I'm going to church. Look how much I'm reading my Bible. You know, look how much I've cleaned the floor. Look, I've stopped smoking. I don't do this. So now you can love me. No, no, God's love isn't affected by any of that. He just goes to a sinner and loves them. Bam, full on. From the first moment, you can't make God love you any more than he does now. So our job is to surrender to that, to come to terms with that, and realize that we have this amazing, amazing covenant love. And it's the opposite to lust. And if you go into um, the culture back then, this was, this was nuts. This was crazy. Even in, I think it, somebody was saying in India, there's a saying where the tears of another, someone outside your family and your friend group, the tears of another are just water. You don't care about other people. You don't care about people who can't help you. You don't serve them. And then this, this love, this agape invaded the world. So now even our government send money to other countries. China doesn't, because China's government's not influenced by the gospel. But any government that's influenced by the gospel, they'll send millions and millions in aid to people that they can't, that can't give them anything back. That's how much this word has, was worked into our culture. And so this is something I'm only, I'm not doing this service, but this is crucial. The, everything hinges on this. So let's ask another question. What is God's attitude toward Jesus and you? Actually, I put it a statement. Here it is. Now, are you ready? This is shouting stuff and I've got six minutes left. Let's see if I can squeeze it all in. John 17, 26, I have revealed you to them, Jesus speaking, and I will continue to do so. Then your, and the apostle John puts that wording it again, your agape for me will be in them and I will be in them. What, what's he talking about? What does that mean? He is telling us that the father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, how much does God, the Father, love God, the Son? I mean, if you were to quantify it, that's the love God has for you. Oh, I just don't feel that. I know it's because you're trying to connect to the wrong kind of love. That If we connect to this story, if we connect to the faithfulness and the strength and the steadfastness and the loyalty and the compassion and the mercy and the grace that all goes into this singularity called agape, when we start to connect to that story and it becomes history within our hearts, it starts to, oh my goodness me, I'm loved by God. What did you do to do it, Mark? I, I didn't, I just realized it was there. That's how much he loves us. He loved, the father loves us with the same passion that he loves the son. Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us, his huge agape, his covenant strength and steadfastness, his unbreakable loyalty. He showed that for us by sending Christ to die for us when we were really behaving well. And once we were going to church four times on a Sunday, reading our Bibles eight times every day, helping old ladies across the street and tithing 90%, then God sent his son to save us. Is that what it says? No, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I know some of you might be tempted to go, oh, Mark, this is so basic. Yeah, it is, but we don't get it. We always want, I want to move on. How about we start living this bit? And you can always tell when someone's living this because they smile more. Because you have, you don't get, you, you won't, the anxiety in the world right now with all the hell that's breaking loose. And I use that word intentionally. If I've got this as an anchor for my soul, if, if my soul is anchored behind the veil in the agape of God, that's well, tough. I don't like it. But people can just lay their lives down. They can be executed. And they say, it's okay. Why? Because they know that they are loved. So the key here, and this is where I've waffled too much. Let's see if we can just squish this in. Is we know how much God loves us and we've put our trust in his love. 1 John 4, 16. This is, this is where the, the wrestling match comes on. This is where we have to struggle. 
is learning to trust that love. Trust it. But Mark, you don't know what I did last night. You don't know what I said. You don't know. I mean, I've, I've been divorced or I've had an affair or I've, uh, I've lost all my money or blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, those, those need to be sorted. There are some issues there. It doesn't affect the love God has for you. And as we trust that love, as we learn to trust what he has done for us, then that makes all the difference. We have this solid certainty that no one can take away from us. And if you go down to verse 14, uh, verse 18, sorry, if we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. You are not going to be punished when Jesus returns if he is your Lord. Oh, I know you deserve it. I mean, to be honest, for you and me together, they need to heat hell up a bit. But we ain't going there because we're in his love. Our sins are forgiven. And without finding any goodness in us whatsoever, God has called us into this relationship with himself where we are in Christ. And that's another story we'll tell another day. So how can we wind this thing up? Let's look very quickly at this. Love is the test of our success for us as a church. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. And let me tell you, I've been racially abused by Christians. I've had Christians steal from me, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So if, if we aren't uh, actually demonstrating love to fellow believers, that's when we question our salvation. You can have a church of 10,000, but if that church is not demonstrating love, I'm suspicious it could actually just be a religious club, not necessarily a church, because the litmus test for a church, the litmus test for a believer is that agape love being seen in their lives. Now, we're not going to get it perfectly like Jesus, but we can move in that direction. It's love that is the test of success, not how many, how big we are, not not how much money we've got, it's love. And then you've got this place where worship and ministry meet. They, they come together and then we reflect the image of God through how we live and the sharing of the gospel. We remember that it wasn't our holiness that made us repent. It was God's kindness that brought us to repentance. And we, sh we reflect that to other people. And then as we learn to really show that love, that agape, that loyalty and strength to each other, that's when the world will look at us and go, oh, they are Jesus people. Because the world, no, they can tell. That they, I tell you, find a good heathen. They'll tell you how to be a Christian. <laughs> and they can see when we're not. They really, really can. And I'm not, I'm not saying we're going to get this perfect and we're all going to walk and go, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Oh, it's marvelous to be with you today. A big part of the body of Christ is we bang heads and iron sharpens iron. But even though we, we crack heads, we don't become enemies. We work it through because we all want the truth. We all want Jesus to be glorified among us. And the warning, the challenge is this. Uh, Revelation chapter two, you can read the context later, but Jesus brings this rebuke. He says, I've got this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. They cooled down. They got into the doctrine, but they'd lost the people. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and look at this next phrase and do the works. You see, love is demonstrated by works. No works, no love. Faith without works is works don't save us but once we get saved they we will start to do the works we're not saved by works we're saved to works so saved people do good works it's that simple and jesus will say you know if you're drift that that's one of the ways you can tell it people say i want to be on fire for god and they normally mean having really good praise and worship and having goosebumps but the people who are really on fire for god they're doing something. They've got their day job. They do their stuff, but maybe they're feeding someone who's hungry. Maybe they're serving somewhere. There's something going on in their lives where they're impacting other people for the better. That's what love is. That's what it is in action. So let's bring this right, right home. And, and we're pretty well there. Love is it's the fuel for a healthy church. And um, Ayo showed this to me. So I've just stolen this completely from the notes of the leaders. Um, 
But I thought, yeah, this love, love does this. You see, love, love uh, let's get my teeth back in. Churches grow warmer through fellowship. What is it that warms up the fellowship? It's love for one another, isn't it? Churches grow deeper through discipleship. Well, I'm not going to bother discipling someone I don't love. <laughs> Churches grow stronger through worship. If I'm not if I'm not going to deliberately love God, my lifestyle isn't going to reflect worship to God. And, um, you know, I'm not going to lift my hands to him or, or do works of service because service is worship as well. Churches grow broader through ministry. Well, I'm not going to minister to people I don't love. I don't, you know, well, what's in it for me? Well, you just serve, you know, you, you spend eight hours in a week to come up with a message to serve some people uh, on the internet. You know, it, it, it's love that drives us. It's, it's the agape. There's this commitment, this, this solidity. And then if we want to grow in numbers, and this is key, I'll just give me, give me 30 seconds to touch on this. Very often evangelism, and I'm quoting John Stott here, is veiled imperialism. Real evangelism is driven by love. Real evangelism is driven by love. So let's make love our story. And you know, uh, 1 Corinthians, and Paul just says with the way of love, after talking about all the gifts and the power, he says, but let me show you a way of life that is best of all. So my encouragement this morning, church, is let's, let's discover the agape of God within the story. Let's make it our story. And then let's allow the world to see this flowing through us in just our normal, ordinary, everyday living.